webinar slash discussion on COVID-19, Understanding the Enemy. Uh, this, uh, this webinar is brought to you by experts from one of our member universities, the University of Ottawa. Uh, my name is Viviana Valencia and I'm the executive coordinator at Caldo. Before we start, I would like to take a few minutes to introduce Caldo to those of you who are not familiar with the consortium. And in addition, I would like to request our audience if there's something you would like to ask, please note the question in the box labeled Q&A at the bottom of your screen, you're gonna find that box. Um, our moderator will address the questions after the, the information is pre presented by your, our key speaker. Okay, so about Caldo. Caldo, um, unlike other organizations, focus solely on Latin American students. Our expertise throughout Latin America help us understand what students are looking for when studying abroad and what we can do to help them in the best ways possible to find their programs at one of the university's uh, members of our consortium in terms of their research interest. We cooperate with a broad run range of international partners, including government agencies and educational institutions to establish our agreements that facilitate higher education mobility from Latin American countries to our 10 member universities. Caldo is a partner with the sponsoring agencies in nine Latin American countries, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Mexico, Panama, Paraguay, Peru, and Uruguay. The Caldo Consortium is composed of 10 uh, of Canada's U15 leading universities, distinguished, distinguished from other Canadian institutions because of their strong research focus. Our members consist of the University of Alberta, University of Calgary, Dalhousie University, Université Laval, McMaster University, the University of Ottawa, the University of Saskatchewan, the University of Toronto, the University of Waterloo, and last but not least, Western University. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to uh, our, our speakers, um, Dr. Alarcón, who will be moderating this session. Uh, Dr. Emilio Alarcón was born in Santiago, Chile. He received his bachelor degree in chemistry at the Universidad de Santiago. He also holds a master in PhD degrees from Pontifica Universidad Católica de Chile. Emilio is currently an associate professor at BMI at uh, the University of Ottawa. And he has published over 78 articles, peer-reviewed journals, edited two books, and various uh, book chapters. Uh, our key speaker, Dr. Marc André Langlois, is an associate professor at the University of Ottawa and Canada Research Chair in Molecular, Molecular Biology and Intrinsic Immunity. Dr. Langlois is recognized for his insights into the fundamental mechanisms of how APOVEC-3 proteins restrict HIV infection. This basic research scientist is a leading authority in the field of intrinsic antiviral defenses. Additionally, he is developing new cutting edge technologies to analyze viruses called nanoscale flow cytometry or flow virometry. <laughs> now, um, Emilio, I will give you the stage so you may um, start the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rihanna. Thank you everyone for being online today. And I'm gonna try to share my screen. I need to find the right screen to share. This is the one. Okay. So I'm not sure if you can see my screen, Viviana? Yes. yes okay, yes, perfect. Yes. So I'm gonna briefly um, show you guys. Can you see my screen okay or not? Or can you see the presentation mode? I'm, um, we're seeing your normal screen, not the presentation okay, mode. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. So first of all, again, thank you so much. And, and the purpose I'm gonna show you today, what the aim of what I, is, I have a couple of slides, you know, I'm not a virologist, but I'm, I'm a scientist. And as pretty much everyone around the world, I've been actually, no, I wouldn't say heavily affected, but uh, our research actually has a, has been forced to, to take a turn, to try to, to, to explore different fields and particularly this is COVID. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show you a couple of slides again. And the main goal in here is for you to understand what do we do in my lab and, and what for is so important, not to only my lab, but for every pretty, pretty much every single lab around the world. Uh, what are we living these days in, in with COVID? So, what we do in the lab is, um, is certainly uh, a little bit of, of what I call 
um, you know, translational medicine, translational biomaterials. And of course, this happens when you, you use Mac, you know, when you're using Apple, uh, when you need the, the computer to work, it doesn't work. And by now it should be actually be playing, but it's here, that, that's the way. So if, uh, you know, my computer doesn't want to work, that is what um, the, 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 the field we explore is uh, uh, translational biomaterials and materials. And the idea of this is uh, producing uh, novel technologies for addressing the, the needs in, in, in the field of, of biomaterials, you know, that we tend to believe that, you know, all the diseases can be cured, but most of the time it's not a case. And uh, in cardiovascular diseases uh, are the leading cause of mortality to this day in Canada. Um, and around the world as well. So I'm not sure, can you see my screen is still? Okay, so we're gonna try to do this in the, with the tiny, tiny view. And uh, I'm sorry guys, this never happened before, but it has to happen just now when I'm sharing the screen. And, okay, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna stop the share. I'm gonna save it again. And just give me one minute. And it doesn't want to work. So or basically what we do is understanding what is needs to be done in terms of the translational aspect of biomaterials and using that as a building block of, of novel technologies and, and building blocks for producing functional materials. So the idea of this is it goes well beyond what we normally understand in the area of tissue regeneration and tissue engineering. So as I'm speaking, I'm trying to fix my computer. And there you go. I think I now I fix it. If I fix it, I can get it done now again. There we go. I think we are now back in business. Perfect. So, sorry again, guys, this is happens with the technology. We are supposed to actually, we rely too much on technology these days. Perfect. So, here we go. Can you see my screen, right? We can see your screen, yes. Okay, perfect. So, the, in my lab, what we do is, uh, I'm gonna use the screen like this, so it's easy for everyone to see a problem. And the purpose of the technologies we are developing is producing these novel materials, the, the technologies that it needs to be, you know, um, used in the clinic for cardiovascular repair and cardiopulmonary repair. So we tend to believe that everything can be fixed, but in reality, it's not the case. So within the, the team we have is, um, we have a, an interdisciplinary team that it works all the way from developing novel functional material for cardiac tissue repair all the way to diagnosis and you know engineering. So we are not only chemists doing chemistry, we have a student from the engineering background, we have biochemists, we have cell biologists, and um, we are always looking for new collaborations because it's what we need. So certainly without having that interdisciplinary connection, it's, uh, it's impossible to do science to the level we, we need to do the science. And these days you have realized that, you know, for, for, for you know, facing what are we facing, COVID, we really need to have an interdisciplinary environment. And within the team, this is what we do. We are really, you know, always seeking for the expert and to have the answers and to have this dynamicity in the, in the research area. So in the team, we do everything, you know, from, you know, building instruments for testing novel materials to building the materials that are needed in the clinical side. Uh, we are proudly located at the University of Ottawa Higher Institute, but uh, my house, academic house at the University of Ottawa. And um, as you see here, uh, what are we actually interested in in COVID is because COVID is certainly an interdisciplinary um, and something that is affecting not only one real. So like if you can start thinking about this, the only continent around the, around the world that is, it has zero cases reported of COVID-19 is Antarctica. So if you want to be safe, you have to go to Antarctica. So, and COVID is affecting the economy, the healthcare and also societies. As when you are, you know, uh, you, you see COVID as a problem, but in reality, this is simply a multifactorial problem that is affecting health, society, and science. And 
together with a group of, of really talented postdoctoral fellows, we have put this, uh, we come up with this idea of COVID spectrum because it's certainly a spectrum of different, you know, um, uh, different effects, effects of, of this, you know, disease affecting not only uh, the, the actual patients, but all the way from mental health to education. So, and uh, within one of the things that I always actually highlight when I visit in uh, South America, uh, is the inter, you know, like the diversity we, not only at the Harry Institute, but the University of Ottawa, we actually have. So this is just to show you guys the number of languages we speak when we are in the lab, of course. No, I think that any number between 25 to 35 languages is average. But you can see here that, you know, the diversity is at the core of, you know, not only the science we do, but also the disciplinary we have to do. Different cultures contribute a lot more than, uh, you know, what actually one might think. And, um, you know, with all this, um, I just to the last slide is a little bit, you know, highlighting, you know, the team. Uh, this is the picture from last year. Uh, we, of course, we are not going to be able to have another picture like this in a long while, but that's okay. The funding agencies are a little bit of the collaborators we have. And without any further introduction, I would like to actually now uh, pass the podium to, to my colleague, Mark andre Langos. Uh, Dr. Mark andre is certainly one of the, the, to me, one of the best biologists we have in Canada. I have learned a lot from him, and uh, he kindly actually accepted my invitation to actually explain in us, the non-biologists, why this enemy is so difficult to, to deal with. Mark andre the podium is yours. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Emilio, for that beautiful introduction. Uh, thanks for you, to you and to Caldo for inviting me to, to talk about uh, the coronavirus. Uh, let me tr attempt to start my presentation here. There we go. There we go. So um, I'm a professor in the Department of uh, Biochemistry, Microbiology, and Immunology at the U University of Ottawa. I'm a molecular virologist. So I'm someone who's interested in how viruses replicate, how they evolve, how they interact with host molecules that are designed to stop viral infections. Every time we are infected by a new pathogen, whether it's a virus or a bacteria, that pathogen found ways to get around uh, several layers of immune defenses. And that's what I'm interested in, is what's happening inside the cell. What is the virus doing to, to be able to infect a new hosts? So my specialty is uh, retroviruses, uh, including HIV. I've been studying uh, HIV and retroviruses for the past 16 years. Uh, over the past two years, I've uh, also broadened my interest to influenza. And now, of course, with the uh, coronavirus outbreak, uh, I've retooled and focused all my research uh, interest to, to this coronavirus because it is a very dangerous virus. It's a virus that is affecting several layers of our livelihood, as Emilio explained, whether it's our health or the economy, uh, our general happiness of being out and interacting with others. Uh, so we, we definitely need to find a new ways to, to stop this uh, epidemic. And uh, thereby the, the title of, uh, of this series, uh, Getting to Know uh, the Enemy. So I will spend the next few minutes explaining to you um, what is the enemy, uh, how the enemy infects, what it does, how it works, and um, what we're doing to stop it. So in this first slide is a number of the important key things that we'll be addressing. Here is uh, uh, the enemy uh, itself, uh, whoop, is the, the coronavirus, of course, and I'll get into uh, great detail what is a coronavirus. But there are other elements like the, the host proteins it interacts with and also the, uh, the host uh, species uh, where the virus can come from and species that the virus can infect, uh, whether it's uh, cats or even the pangolin. So let's get starting, started. So what is a coronavirus? Well, a coronavirus is a virus that is uh, what we call an RNA virus. So it, it contains an RNA genome, not a DNA genome, an RNA genome. And it's, uh, it's part of a large family. There are several coronaviruses. They're not just one. Um, the genus of this, uh, of this virus is actually a beta coronavirus. And we'll, we'll see a little bit more about the different uh, types of coronaviruses in a few slides. 
why is it called the coronavirus? Corona means crown. So here on the left, if you look at the electron micrograph of the, of the virus, what you can see is that the virus clearly has this very, very highly re refractive uh, circumference uh, around the, the particle uh, that is uh, very, very noticeable. And on top, you have these little spikes, and these are the viral glycoproteins. So these are the, the little proteins that are responsible for attaching, uh, for, letting, for enabling the virus to attach to your lung epithelial cells. If we move towards uh, more the, the cartoon, uh, here in yellow, we see the spikes. The virus also has uh, a number of, um, of other proteins uh, around it. It has the envelope protein that is inserted in the outer shell. It has the membrane protein that is one of the most abundant proteins of the virus. And here inside these little beads here, these are the nucleoproteins. These are proteins that coat the viral genomic RNA and protect it uh, inside each of these uh, particles. Now, the uh, coronavirus that is causing the, the epidemic is, is the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but it's very, very similar to another coronavirus that circulated and caused an epidemic a few years ago in 2003, which is a SARS-CoV or SARS-CoV-1. Um, what does the viral genome look like? Now, this is um, a very interesting RNA virus because it's quite large. Um, most RNA viruses have shorter genomes, around 10,000 bases or 10 KB. This one is quite large. It has 30,000 uh, bases approximately. Um, this viral RNA genome uh, is a positive sense RNA, which means that the genome of the virus actually looks like an mRNA. It has a 5' prime methyl cap and a poly A tail. That means when this virus gets into the cell, it looks like an mRNA and behaves like an mRNA. So when the virus gets into the cell, its genome gets translated. And this is the first peptide here that gets translated in the genome. So this peptide here encodes two very important proteins for the viral life cycle. Uh, here in blue is the viral protease, and in gray here is the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So this is a, an enzyme that is unique uh, to, to viruses, uh, especially. Uh, the human genome does not uh, encode an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. That's a polymerase that uses an RNA to make RNA. So when the virus gets into the cell, the first thing it does is that it translates. It makes this polyprotein here. The protease then starts chopping it up into its uh, build, building blocks. And then once the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase is released, it can go back to the RNA and start making full length uh, copies of it. And uh, when we say copies, the first copy will be, of course, a minus strand RNA. So a copy is a different polarity. And from that minus strand RNA, it will make a large quantity of what we call subgenomic RNAs that are right here on the right. So from this genome, in the second phase, it needs a minus strand RNA template and makes bunch of these proteins here. These are the most abundant proteins of the virus. And this is here where you see the spike, the, mem uh, the, um, the membrane protein, and the envelope protein are all part of these, uh, what we call subgenomic RNAs. So what do we know about coronaviruses from the others uh, that are circulated? Uh, because we're only starting to understand uh, what the SARS-CoV-2 looks like, what it does. So in terms of the size, what size is this virus? It's about 100 uh, nanometers. Uh, actually, between 100 and, and 120 nanometers. It's uh, not clear what the exact size of it, but, but it's around that size, which means it goes through most of your filters. Uh, you cannot filter out viruses, or not easily, uh, viruses of this size. Um, what else uh, do we know about this virus? So here on the surface, we talked about the spike proteins. So there are about 100 of these trimeric spikes around the virus. Now, each one of these spikes is actually a trimer. So this is why we call, it, call them trimeric spikes. So if there's 100 spikes around the virus, there's 100 monomeric units of the spike protein. So this protein here is not the most abundant protein in the virus. Here in red is the membrane protein about 2,000 copies of this membrane protein is inserted throughout the, the virus, and this is the most abundant protein. Then you have the no nucleoprotein, 
these little balls here in blue that protect the RNA genome inside the virus. And then the envelope uh, proteins that are also inserted in the uh, outer layer of the virus, about uh, 100 monomers of those, uh, of those proteins. In terms of the replication uh, scale, so how fast does this virus replicate? Well, from the point where it attaches to its, surf to its receptor on the surface of a cell, uh, this virus will take about 10 minutes to get inside the cell. From there, uh, the RNA gets uh, released from the particles, it gets translated into protein, uh, it makes the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and then it takes about uh, 10 hours for the virus to start really replicating its RNA. So, so it's about 10 hours uh, before it starts making new, uh, new virions that are released from that cell, so, which is very quick. Uh, that means that, you know, within a day, you start uh, from, from getting the virus, you start making new virus. What's interesting about um, this virus, um, this RNA virus, compared to other RNA viruses, it does have proofreading ability, which means that when it replicates its genome, uh, it makes very few errors. Uh, compared to influenza, the virus that causes the flu, that has a very high error rate, uh, compared to HIV, which also has a very high error rate, uh, this virus here has proofreading, so the error rate is much smaller. So this has special implications about uh, vaccine design uh, or the fear of mutations. Well, this virus will not mutate as quickly as influenza, and that's very important to know. Uh, the receptor on the surface of the cells that this virus will attach to is called ACE, angiotensin-converting enzyme 2. Uh, so receptor, so it's on the surface of the variety of cells and, and most importantly, lung cells, which is the point of entry uh, into the body. So where do these coronaviruses come from? Have they always been around? Are they new? Because we heard about it's a new coronavirus. Um, well, these viruses have been around for a very, very long time, and there are a lot of coronaviruses out there. There are about 3,200 uh, coronavirus species in nature that we know of, and this was only from 2017. There might actually be more. Uh, these are viruses that can infect a wide range of animals, uh, including swine, cattle, horses, camels, cats, dogs, rodents, birds, bats, very important in, in the life cycle, and uh, some reptiles, and humans, of course. So there are several clades of these uh, coronaviruses, as you can see here. There are the alpha coronaviruses, uh, there are some uh, beta coronaviruses that are in uh, sub, uh, sub clades here uh, that we're going to get into, gamma coronaviruses, uh, delta coronaviruses. So there are, there are several families of these coronaviruses out there. Here with the red arrow is where the uh, SARS-CoV-2 stands. Um, so this illustration was done before the outbreak, so uh, SARS-CoV-2 is very similar to SARS-CoV, so it, it would be somewhere here uh, in the um, uh, B clade of uh, the beta coronaviruses. MERS, which is another uh, coronavirus that infected humans a few years ago, uh, is here in the C clade. The, the um, SARS coronaviruses are not the only coronaviruses that infect humans. There are actually seven of them now that we know of. Um, these are the coronavirus 229E, NL63, OC43, HKU1, uh, uh, MERS, uh, SARS, and now uh, SARS-CoV-2. So SARS-CoV-2, very similar phylogenetically to, uh, to, to the first SARS. And then uh, the next uh, level of uh, complementarity in terms of its genome is to the MERS uh, coronavirus that, that, that we have here. So if we look closer at the different um, of these human coronaviruses and, and where do they end up? Um, so the SARS-CoV-2 is here in the beta coronavirus in the B lineage. Uh, it's somewhere here. Um, the uh, MERS is here in the C lineage. These other coronaviruses uh, here are in the A lineage and uh, the others are in the alpha lineage. Now in these boxes uh, indicates what is the actual origin of these coronaviruses. Because in all cases, these are zoonotic transmission of a virus from an animal to human, uh, which is not a direct transfer, but goes through an intermediate host, an adaptation there, acquisition of new mutations, new properties, and then uh, into a first human, 
where it continues to adapt and then it spreads. So if we look at the uh, possible origins uh, of the SARS-CoV-2, what we see is bats uh, are definitely where uh, the virus initially started, but there is presumably an intermediate host. Viverids um, uh, is a possibility and a canny forms also as an intermediate host. Um, and uh, canny forms are, it can be dogs or bears or the type of mammal. And viverids are civets, uh, therefore a type of rodent. MERS uh, also originated in bats, but the intermediate host, the one that actually uh, tra transmitted the virus to humans are actually camelids, camels. Uh, this is where the humans caught it. Um, the other coronaviruses here in blue, OC43 and HKU1, uh, we believe have come from rodents originally. Uh, and here are the other coronaviruses, uh, 229E and NL63, also coming from bats uh, and possibly camelids, camels uh, or llamas uh, for the uh, other coronaviruses. If we look at the sequence, the genetic sequence of the RNA uh, in the SARS-CoV-2, and we align it to all the sequences of the coronaviruses we know of, what is the sequence that it most closely comes, uh, pairs with? Um, so it comes cl the closest to the genetic sequences of coronaviruses we see in bats. So we're talking about approximately 96% identity in sequence of a coronavirus species that is found in bats. If you were following the news of the epidemic, uh, at some point they said, oh, pangolins are the source of the virus. Uh, it's because uh, we were eating pangolins that the virus was transmitted to humans. Well, that is not true. Um, the pangolin coronaviruses do have a high level of sequence uh, identity with the current virus, but uh, it is believed according to special, specific features and components uh, in, in that virus that the virus indeed comes from bats. However, there is a, uh, an intermediate host that, was that has not yet been uh, fully uh, identified. If we com com compare the SARS-CoV-2 um, that is circulating now to the SARS of 2003, there's about 80% sequence identity. So it's not SARS-CoV-1 that evolved into SARS-CoV-2. Uh, it's a different virus. There's a different origin to it. MERS has 55% uh, sequence, uh, nucleotide sequence identity. And the other uh, coronaviruses we mentioned that cause the common cold, about 50%. And in all cases, what we see is that there's a primary host for the coronavirus. Primary hosts, or what we call the reservoirs, are animals that can be infected with the coronavirus, but don't die off from it. And this is what you want from a reservoir, is if the animal gets sick from the virus and dies, um, that virus would die with them. So what we're talking about here are animals that can tolerate very, very well the presence, the, the, the chronic presence of these coronaviruses, not fall sick, but are still able to transmit that coronavirus to other species. And th these are what we call the intermediate hosts. Um, for coronaviruses, civets, as I mentioned, are a, a primary host, camels. Um, the possibility of intermediate hosts for, for humans, uh, there's still the idea of pangolins. Uh, pangolins might have a role, but they're not the, the primary host. Uh, there might be another animal species we don't know of. Um, in the news, they were, it was said at some point that snake coronaviruses from snakes could have been an intermediate host, but this has been now disproved. And uh, it's not also, you don't get the SARS-CoV-2 directly from eating bats. That is not how it's transmitted. So this can be excluded. Then it gets into the primary human host and we sneeze on our friends, we sneeze on our families and our, on our coworkers. And that's where the virus spreads and infects uh, larger and larger communities. And uh, this is where uh, this virus uh, is especially nasty because it has very, very severe respiratory symptoms. So what is the difference between uh, SARS, uh, COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2? We, we hear this a lot in the news. They're being used interchangeably. Um, there is a correct appellation for, for both. And I like to say, uh, being from this field, uh, the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, is to AIDS, the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, as SARS-CoV-2 is to COVID-19. So SARS-CoV-2, when you talk about SARS-CoV-2, you're talking about the virus itself, 
the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. When you're talking about COVID-19, you're talking about the disease that the virus is causing. So if you're, you're hearing about a study about COVID-19, you're, you're talking about the patients, you're talking about what is happening in individuals. So this is very important. So this is um, an interesting study. This is one of the first studies um, that came out. Um, this was done on uh, 90, uh, on, sorry, on, on 12 COVID-19 patients uh, with moderate disease. These were not the heavily sick individuals. Uh, these were moderately infected uh, individuals. This is a study that uh, came from uh, Wuhan and in China in the very beginning to try to understand uh, the kinetics of uh, the propagation of the virus. So as you know, uh, the way we, we, can, uh, we, we test for the virus is that uh, you go to a testing center and generally in most cases, they will take a, a nasopharyngeal swab. So a swab from the, uh, the, the back of your upper respiratory tract and take that swab and uh, resuspend whatever virus there is in, 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 a, in the buffer and then perform uh, PCR, RT-PCR, so convert the RNA into DNA, and then try to amplify the DNA. Uh, and this is how uh, we detect for the presence of the virus, SARS-CoV-2. Um, so there are different methods to harvest that, that virus. So the nasopharyngeal swab uh, here in, uh, in yellow is a primary method. But there's another method too that should not be disregarded is sputum. So this is when you, you spit. So the first, uh, first thing in the morning and when you wake up, if you spit, uh, apparently there's a high level of virus in there. And this is what this study did. So it compared uh, the levels of RNA uh, in a small number of individuals uh, over time to see how the, the disease progresses. So what we see here in, uh, in yellow is a swab analysis and in orange is sputum. In gray is very interesting. This is the presence of uh, viral RNA in stool. So uh, we can detect the presence of RNA in a human stool. It's unclear, still unclear at this time if the virus is still infectious in stool. It probably is not. Uh, however, you can detect coronavirus uh, RNA in stool. And this is what the study is show showing. And uh, where the arrow is pointing is where uh, the, the, the individual patients have seroconverted. Seroconverted means um, the time at which they start making specific antibodies against this virus. So what we see here is at the very early stage, we see uh, an increase in RNA, and especially here in sputum in this first patient, and it, it's going down in time, it's going down, we see detection in stool. And at the point of zero conversion, then we see a drop, a dramatic drop in, in the levels of the RNA. And this is a general tendency. So we see a zero conversion somewhere between day eight and day 10 in most individuals. Uh, and right after the zero conversion, we see a drop in the RNA. Now in the news, you may have heard, oh, we still detect the virus in, in individuals after 20 days, after 30 days, after 40 days. Well, the question is, are you actually detecting the virus or are you actually just detecting the RNA? And this is what you're seeing here in, in this study, which is very, very clear, is that even after 20 days, um, you can see the, the virus in some individuals. You can still detect uh, viral RNA in some individuals. Now, this doesn't mean that, the, that these individuals still have replicating virus. It means that probably some cells were infected with the virus, the virus was, uh, was destroyed, the viral RNA uh, or, or bits of the R viral RNA have persisted and are eventually eliminated from the body. This is why we see, we see them in stools and we see them in sputum. You might have uh, cells that were damaged uh, and that you're, you're, you're spitting up and they, they, they still have the, uh, the RNA. So this is very important to, to understand in the disease. So it's not because you have, you're positive for a test that you actually have infectious replicating virus. All it means is that there's the viral RNA uh, in your samples. So how is SARS-CoV-2 different to other coronaviruses? And this is a question that I'm asked often, very often. Uh, a lot of people think that coronaviruses is just like flu. It is not. So the first thing I'm going to say, coronaviruses and flu are different viruses. They are both uh, RNA viruses, uh, but they are uh, completely different types of RNA viruses. It's not the same disease. 
Um, I mentioned that there's a number of uh, coronaviruses that cause the common cold. Um, these are, have generally very uh, mild symptoms. Um, you cough a little bit, you don't feel well, but uh, most people, the vast majority of people do not die from these coronaviruses, which is ironic because for, they all infect us regularly, either uh, every winter in Canada or every other winter. Uh, but very little research has been conducted on these viruses, mainly because they don't make us very sick. We recover from them. Um, the other coronaviruses, these three are the, are the, are the, are the killers. So SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-1, and, and, and MERS. And this is how they're different. They're, they have very different features. So if we, we start here in this table and we look at the uh, R0, this is, basically, this is called the basic reproductive number. Uh, what, what this number means here is for every individual that is infected and infectious, how many people can they infect on average? So this is always done sort of retrospectively when you look at the size of the epidemic and knowing how many people have seeded the epidemic. So in the case of influenza and flu, it's about 1.3. So which means that uh, you might or might not infect a second person. Uh, you'll, you'll infect probably one person, maybe not two. In the case of the COVID, um, uh, of SARS-CoV-2, uh, every ind infected individual will infect uh, between 2 and 2.5, which is almost three individuals. SARS-CoV-1 was slightly more infectious. More people would get infected from a single infection. And uh, MERS was uh, much less infected, uh, infectious. So if, if you see here, the reproductive number is below 1, which means that is a virus that might start an outbreak but dies off very, very quickly. It does not propagate in the population very well. CFR is the case fatality rate. Case means you, you need a positive diagnostic, uh, diagno diagnosis for the presence of the viral RNA. And of those that have been diagnosed, so those are usually those going into hospital if you're diagnosed because you're not feeling well and you're, you're, you're really scared because you're, you're, you have trouble uh, breathing. Um, this is how many of these people will actually die. From SARS-CoV-2, it's about uh, three, it says 3.4 here. There are numbers uh, from the literature are somewhere between two and three uh, that we know of now. Influenza, uh, how many people die from it? Well, between 0 0.05 and 1%. So if you compare these two and they say, well, the coronavirus is just flu, it's not. Coronavirus, uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, will kill between 30 and 50 times more people uh, than the standard flu. Now, SARS, the SARS-1, was uh, much more lethal. It would kill about 10% of people showing up in hospital and testing positive, and MERS, about 34%. So this was a scary one, but it died off very quickly. Now, the next parameter is very important. And this is the incubation time. And this is a, a number that I appreciate very well coming from the HIV field. If we look at flu, the incubation time is very short. So between one to four days, SARS is two to seven, and, and MERS is six. Now, SARS-CoV-2 is between four and 14 days. So what is the incubation time? Incubation time is the time between being infected and displaying symptoms. So during that time, you're actually infectious. You're producing virus, you're shedding virus, and you don't know, you don't have symptoms. Now this is key because coming from the HIV field, HIV is capable of going into latency. So you get infected with HIV, and sometimes, uh, with that, if you don't know your status, you only start displaying proper uh, AIDS symptoms after five or 10 years. So during that span of time, you're spreading the virus. And this is why HIV spread so vastly around the globe uh, with 39 million people and it's still infected today is because of this latency. It's because the virus goes undetected for so long and people can spread it. Now compared to flu and SARS, which display symptoms very, very early, so they, people know when they're sick and you can quarantine, SARS-CoV-2, you can go in between you know, four and 14 days without symptoms. So you can spread the virus, spread the virus without the population knowing, and then all of a sudden everyone's sick. And this is what happened with this virus. And this is what, why, what makes this virus uh, so uh, difficult to, um, to counteract is that it goes undetected uh, for so long. So this is uh, part of the key is this, reprodu is, um, this uh, reproductive number in combination with the incubation time. So um, where are we at now with, uh, with the epidemic? So what, what does it look like? So uh, at the time I'm preparing these slides, 
Um, there's, um, pardon me, there's about 5.2 million people infected worldwide. 340,000 have died so far, and this is in less than six months. Um, this number is quite low because, as you know, around the globe, there were some very, very aggressive measures uh, that were deployed to stop air travel, stop tourism, um, force people inside their homes to pre prevent the spread of this highly contagious virus. It's expected that in the, the next years or so, about 40% of the population um, will become exposed to the virus, uh, infected and, 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 and exposed. Now, you have to remember that not everyone dies from this virus. So it's only 3% of those that actually show up in hospital. So this is not a virus that will wipe out humanity. Uh, however, it, it is a virus that will uh, wipe out a lot of people, especially those with um, uh, underlying uh, comorbidities. Uh, we know that anything, uh, any individual with uh, issues that are cardiopulmonary, uh, problem uh, individuals with high blood pressure, um, anyone with a uh, weak immune system, cancer patients are highly susceptible to, to this virus and, and will struggle to clear it. And in fact, most cases they, they will develop COVID-19 and will not do very well. Now, another thing that you must bear in mind is that um, this is not just like influenza or another infection where you're infected, you don't feel well, you recover and you're normal. In most cases uh, with SARS-CoV-2, if you do develop COVID-19 and severe symptoms, uh, it is believed now that you will have long-term consequences, long-term health consequences um, to your lungs, um, to your kidneys, um, maybe to your heart. So these are uh, very important uh, preoccupations we have now is that uh, it's not just something that will go away. Those that have been infected and were very sick uh, might develop some very uh, some complications uh, in five or 10 or 15 years. So this is why we need to stop the, the virus uh, and not just let it spread. Uh, it's because there will be consequences down the line. Even if you don't die from it, um, you will have morbidities. Your, your life, the quality of your life will be reduced through the, the consequences of this virus. Now, this next slide uh, I, is a very important resource for me. This is from uh, Johns Hopkins uh, University. Uh, the website is here on the side. Uh, this tracks the epidemic in real time. It's a wonderful tool. Uh, it gives you uh, metadata from all, uh, all the countries that are reporting their infections properly. Um, in the US now there's 1.6 million infections. Russia is the second up and look at Brazil. Brazil is coming up uh, in third place. Um, also we have Peru that is up in, on the Palmares uh, here. Uh, Chile, Mexico are, are, are gaining in, um, in numbers of uh, infected people, as you can see from the bubbles here. Uh, these bubbles here are the number of daily cases, not total cases. Uh, these are daily cases. So the bigger the bubble, uh, the higher the number of daily cases uh, are appearing. So these numbers on the left are historical numbers, so total cumulative numbers. But the bigger the bubble, uh, the bigger the, the current outbreak, and we're going to see more and more people. So where are we seeing this? Uh, South America is being hit very badly. Europe is being hit very badly. Africa is doing uh, well so far. Here on the right is uh, the number of daily cases. So around the world, uh, over 100,000 new cases every single day. So this is still uh, a huge problem. Uh, this virus has spread everywhere. It's not going anywhere. So we, we have to study it and we have to make it stop. So what is the infection cycle uh, of this virus? So if we step back and look at how it replicates, because this is something I love and I'm very interested in is how it works. It's like the engineering part of the virus, the mechanical part uh, inside the cell. So the coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2, will bind to its natural receptor uh, on the surface uh, of the cell, uh, the ACE2 uh, receptor here, and then gets internalized. So I mentioned to you that it's a positive sense uh, RNA genome. So positive sense RNAs, look like mRNAs, they get immediately translated uh, into uh, a polyprotein. That polyprotein, uh, as we mentioned earlier, encodes two key en uh, enzymes at first, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase and the protease. So once it's in, it produces this, uh, this polymerase. It reattaches to its RNA, and then it starts making a negative sense full-length copy. 
and then uses this negative sense copy as a template uh, to make uh, what we call the subgenomic RNAs. Subgenomic means inside the genome. It means these are the RNAs made a little bit later. Um, so the virus then starts pumping out all of these proteins here, the, the nucleocapsid, the spike, the membrane, and then it just produces these in very, very large quantities. These RNAs then get um, translated and then insert themselves in the cell in critically important areas. And in the case of the coronavirus, it's in the, um, the, the, the walls, it's in the membrane of the ER. And this is where you see all the viral proteins inserting themselves inside there. The spike is inserting itself in there, the membrane proteins, the envelope. And then what happens is that these here will, will form these, uh, the, these vesicles inside the cell. And these proteins, especially the M protein, um, the E protein, will act as magnets for the N protein, the nucleocapsid. The nucleocapsid protein, the N protein, has very, very high affinity for the viral RNA and will code it. And this is what we see here. So it's coding the viral RNA. And then the N protein has high affinity for M, for E, and also for spike. So they act like magnets. And this is how the genome will attach itself to these proteins. And then it will bud inside these vesicles. And then the, the virus will eventually be released by exocytosis. So what is important to understand here is that uh, SARS-CoV-2 is not a lytic virus. It's not a virus that causes the cells to explode uh, somewhat like uh, influenza. Um, this virus will actually uh, just bud out at a constant rates from the ER. So which means it preserves those infected cells for longer. So these cells can just continue producing viruses uh, that are released um, from, uh, from the uh, endocytic pathway. So a little, a little uh, more um, details here about uh, how the virus will enter the cell. So here we have the coronavirus. Uh, I mentioned that the uh, spike protein is a trimeric protein. Uh, here is a, an illustration, uh, 3D illustration of uh, the crystal of that, uh, of that protein. Here is a, a 2D version here uh, where you have the N-terminus, the C-terminus. Now there are two main uh, subunits to the spike. Uh, we call that the S1 subunit and the S2 subunit. Each of these subunits have a distinct function. The S1 subunit is uh, responsible for the attachment of the virus to uh, the surface of its target cell. This subunit here contains what is called the receptor binding domain here in purple. This here in purple is what binds to ACE2. The um, fusion or S2 subunit is what is responsible. So once the virus is attached to its receptor, the S2 unit is responsible for taking that virus and helping it fuse with the cell envelope and getting that genetic material inside the cell. And this is what we call the fusion domain. Uh, it also contains uh, the transmembrane domain of, uh, of the spike protein, so that it en en enables here, you see the transmembrane domain, trans uh, membrane domain would be right here. It's, it's what allows the spike to be presented on the outside of the virus. And here at the very end, it's not illustrated, but that's the ER localization signal. Now, what is really important within um, the spike protein sequence is these two sites here, S1, S2, and S2 prime. These are two cle protease cleavage sites. These are absolutely critical uh, to enable the virus to infect the cell. So there are two cleavage um, uh, steps to allow the virus to enter. There's the first site, the S1, S2, that's cut by uh, host proteins. These are not cut by viral pro, uh, pro they're not, this protein is not cut by the viral protease. These are, uh, this, this pro, uh, spike protein is cut by cellular prote proteases that are at the surface of the cell. So S1, S2 is believed to be cut by uh, the furin uh, protease. And there's a first cut here. And then there's a second cut being done here in the second domain, S2 prime. Um, and this is called, uh, cut by a, a host protease called TMPRSS2. Uh, so both these cleavage events, very, very important. And this is what we see here in a different illustration from a different um, article. We have the coronavirus binding to its ACE2 receptor. And this is what we see here in the first conformation where you have uh, the S2, the S1 with the receptor binding domain interacting with the ACE2. And then you have the cellular proteases here, furin and TMPRSS2. First cleavage site here, second cleavage site here. 
once these proteases cut into that S2, there's a rearrangement of that spike protein on the surface of the virus, and it's already very, very close to the cell surface. And that S2 becomes what is called activated. Oops. And once it's activated, it will allow the virus to melt, to fuse uh, with the, the cellular membrane that is here in pink. The virus will melt into it, and this is what will allow the viral RNA to get into the cell and then get translated. So this is very key. Now, um, with the Dr. Emilio Alarcón, uh, we have a collaborative project, and it's a very exciting one. Uh, Dr. Alarcón is, is an expert in developing uh, peptides, and uh, what we're trying to do is uh, actually not bind, uh, not to, um, to use the peptides to prevent the binding to the receptor. What we're trying to do is actually trying to find ways to use peptides here to interfere uh, with the cleavage steps of uh, the spike protein. So finding uh, peptides that will compete with the proteases or mask the sites uh, of, uh, of this uh, maturation on the surface of, of the virus, which is a, a, a target that's been uh, underappreciated um, as uh, being a potential therapeutic for protecting against um, SARS-CoV-2. So, um, just gonna move this. so another question I get often is, uh, well, will this uh, SARS-CoV-2 go away? When will the pandemic end? Um, and, and this is a question that everyone is asking. Well, uh, I'm quite certain that eventually in a very, very short future, um, next few months, what, uh, weeks, what we'll see are drugs and antivirals um, will be uh, developed or repurposed um, to, to be able to, um, to help those suffering from COVID-19. Um, so these are basically drugs that exist already, um, drugs that uh, interfere with the replication of other viruses, that are being tested to see if they can also inhibit uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, in a COVID setting. So in, in those, in the sickest individuals in hospital, can these drugs um, inhibit the virus? Uh, I think you're all aware that uh, hydroxychloroquine that was uh, highly advertised by a president of uh, another country um, completely failed in uh, clinical trials. Uh, it's a drug that is no longer recommended for the treatment of COVID-19 uh, due to the uh, hard complications uh, that it causes, and there's no evidence that it stops uh, or improves, uh, doesn't stop the virus or improves the quality of uh, the health of those infected by COVID-19. Um, at this moment in time, there is no known drug um, that can work as a prophylaxis or stop new infections uh, of the virus. There are drugs that are being tested that seem to uh, slow down the progression of the virus and help um, alleviate some of the symptoms of COVID-19. Uh, remdesivir is uh, one of them. However, um, this is one of the drugs that can only be administered in hospital. It has to be injected. There are other, also other uh, antivirals, anti, uh, other anti-SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, drugs uh, that are being developed. Uh, most notably uh, antibodies, either from co convalescent serum or genetically engineered. However, these will likely need to be administered uh, intravenously or in a hospital setting um, to stop uh, the symptoms. But again, these will be only administered to the most sick individuals, the most needing uh, individuals, and will not help the general population or the spread of this virus. So how are we going to get at the end, to the end of this? How are we going to get rid of SARS-CoV-2 and hopefully get our lives back? Um, well, that concept is called herd immuni immunity. So herd immunity is the concept by which um, if every person in society is uh, one of these dots, um, you have uh, the individuals that are uh, unvaccinated, uh, black dots uh, infected, and, and, and yellow dots uh, vaccinated. The more individuals that are immune to a pathogen, and this is not just this virus, this is the, the theory of vaccination in general, is that the more individuals that are um, infected, uh, vaccinated in the population, the fewer places the virus can go uh, if it infects the first individual. Of course, if no one's uh, infected and it's a highly infectious virus, uh, we can expect it to spread to the whole population within a certain amount of time. You introduce vaccination, if you get a very low adoption rate, so if people are reluctant in taking a vaccine, 
uh, or the vaccine doesn't work very well and you only get 25% of individuals developing sterilizing an immunity, which means an immunity that will completely neutralize the virus, you still get massive spread of the virus. That is not enough. 50%, it's starting to get better. You're starting to slow down that spread of the virus, but you're not fully eliminating it. There is a threshold at which you need to vaccinate and immunize a, a population to completely stop a pathogen and make it go away. It's a very simple way of seeing it is that, you know, if you have the first individual that's infected, um, the virus will try to find somewhere to go, somewhere to propagate, um, will try to infect the next nearest person. But if that next nearest person is all, are all vaccinated, that virus has nowhere to go. It has no home to, to replicate and will eventually die off and disappear. And this is uh, how we eradicate uh, viral diseases is by uh, very high adoption rates of vaccination to, to basically uh, eliminate the, 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 the potential human reservoir of that uh, vaccine. So what is the case with um, SARS-CoV-2? Well, when will it go away? When will the pandemic end? Well, the answer, the real answer is never without a vaccine. There's too many people infected worldwide now. Uh, vaccine, the virus is still spreading. We're never gonna get rid of this virus. It will become endemic un until we get a vaccine. The, um, the case fatality rate, as uh, I mentioned earlier, is about 3%. So if we do a very gross analysis, if we say that uh, the virus spreads to absolutely everyone on earth uh, and 3% uh, die, we're talking about 228 million people dying. And this is absolutely unacceptable. Uh, it's unlikely to be the case, but it, it's a horrendous number and this cannot happen. So with a reproductive rate of 2.4, as I mentioned, the immunity threshold. So how, what percentage of the population needs sterilizing immunity, needs complete immunity to the virus to stop the spread of the virus uh, from going anywhere and hopefully make the virus go away. Uh, in this case of this virus, it's about 60%. So we need 60% of individuals that are vaccinated that have antibodies against uh, this virus. Now, there are some individuals that are saying, well, let's let the virus spread and everyone will get natural immunity to the virus. Well, this doesn't work. If we look at countries that were heavily hit with the, uh, with the, the pandemic and we survey the general population, what we're seeing is uh, the current, current data coming out, um, the overall uh, population that has been being exposed by uh, doing serological tests, so looking at antibodies, is between two to 5% of the general population. At this rate, you will never stop the virus. It's not enough. And of course, it's an RNA virus. It does have proofreading ability, but it can still mutate. So um, this, this virus will spread and spread and spread until we, we, we have a virus uh, vaccine to, to stop it. And even that vaccine will only work against the current strain. Uh, the virus might acquire new mutations. And that means that even those that have prior immunity to SARS-CoV-2 might not be immune to the new virus coming around in 12 months time, six months time. So we absolutely need to do something um, in terms of vaccines for this uh, virus. And this is where I talk about vaccines. So a vaccine is not a single entity. There's not a single way of producing vaccines. There are different types of vaccines. They have different um, qualities, different uh, ways of working. Um, some vaccines um, are, are basically taking the, the natural uh, virus that is going around, weakening it through genetic means uh, by introducing mutations. So you basically have a replicative virus, but it doesn't replicate so well, and it can elicit uh, very strong immune responses, but this could have also side effects and the virus can, can also mutate back. You can um, also completely kill the virus and just administer it as an antigen and you can build immune responses to that. Newer technologies are where you don't, uh, where you can use um, uh, viral vectors, you can use a different virus and just express the, uh, the spike protein on the surface. This can be done with measles. Uh, it's a problem with a prior immunity. So if you've already been immune to uh, the, the core uh, virus, you, you will be immune to this vaccine. So it won't work very well in you. Uh, new technologies are also looking at uh, non-replicating adenoviruses. These are non-enveloped viruses, but that express the viral spike on the surface. This, these, viruses, these vaccines also work very well. Um, very new technologies is where you don't administer the virus at all. You just put the genetic material of the virus into a host, uh, either the DNA and the RNA, and hope to make the viral proteins. And you hope that these viral proteins are expressed on the surface of the cells uh, to confer immunity. 
so there are a number of companies that are doing this. And uh, of course, there's a, there are different methods as well to make vaccines where you just uh, administer the proteins. So the last few, few slides are actually what, I, what I'm doing in my lab. Uh, if any of you are interested uh, in joining my team, um, so here I, there are four uh, distinct pillars of our interest is developing uh, diagnostics and therapeutics using single domain antibodies that I'm going to explain to you what, what they are. Serological tests, so monitoring the antibody humoral responses. Uh, we have a, a test that is functional in the lab, an ELISA, and also developing a plant-based nasal spray vaccine. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So um, single domain antibodies, uh, what are they? So here on the left is a general antibody that you produce. It looks like an immunoglobulin type G, so an IgG. Uh, these typical antibodies, these Y-shaped antibodies, um, have two heavy chains that you see here, two light chains, and the uh, antigen binding domain requires both the heavy chain and the light chain and interaction of both to recognize an antigen here on the surface. Uh, these antibodies are quite big, 150 kilodaltons. Um, but what we're trying to do are single domain antibodies. And to produce those, we need uh, llamas uh, or camelids, uh, in our case, llamas. Why llamas? Because llamas have, make different types of antibodies that are very interesting. They only have two heavy chains. So they're, very, they're much smaller, 80 kilodaltons. And what we're trying to do is to basically clone just the tip of it, just the part at the tip of the antibody um, that binds to the antigen. And this little tip here is called a VHH, uh, or a single domain antibody, or in the literature, you'll also call these nanobodies. And these can bind to the antigens with very similar specificity to the native antibody and even to human antibodies. And this is what we're trying to clone in the lab uh, because they're very efficient. And these can be used to block uh, sites or be used as diagnostics. Just a quick uh, overview how we produce these. So we take our favorite llama, uh, we inject it with the spike protein of the coronavirus. We let the llama make an immune response to that spike protein, collect its blood. Uh, the B cells clone the, um, the antibody uh, producing genes from the llama and insert that gene into uh, phages. And we, uh, phages, bacterial phages. That, and then we produce these phages and we uh, conduct what is called phage display. So we put antigens on the bottom of a plate and run these phages uh, on the plate and see which ones will bind uh, to our target antigen, which is the spike protein or any region of the, the, the spike we want, and keep uh, panning, uh, which means keep selecting for, these, uh, for, for the best binders, and then clone them in the lab. Basically take the sequence, those, uh, those, those genetic sequences of the, the antibodies, and then mass produce these VHH um, or, or single domain antibodies. We can use these as diagnostics, as therapeutics. If we want them to use them as therapeutics, we can fuse them to the FC fragment of a human antibody. That just increases the life um, span of the, the single domain antibodies in blood and uh, can be used to, um, to block the virus uh, in uh, infected individuals. Uh, second thing we're doing in the lab is uh, these serological tests. So trying to monitor uh, well, when the antibodies are produced. So this is a, a nice uh, graph showing here in red, the viral RNA. And here are the antibody responses for IgM, IgA, and IgG. We see the first responses, as I mentioned, around day eight, and then we see the IgMs climbing, IgA is climbing, and then they go down as the, the peak for IgG starts. This is where uh, we call this uh, class switching, where these IgMs and IgAs are switching to, to or, or IgMs are switching to IgGs uh, at this stage. And this is where you see the viral RNA drop in, in our, our hosts. So why are we developing these serological tests? Because we can answer a bunch, bunch of questions that are very, very hard to, um, to, to ask otherwise. Uh, we want to measure the total uh, number of people in, um, that were exposed in the population. This is important to understand herd immunity. Measure the number of asymptomatic individuals, those that shed the virus and don't have symptoms. This, we still don't know what percentage of individuals are like that. Track the persistence of antibodies, uh, the neutralizing antibodies. Um, conduct antibody neutralization studies. It's not because you make antibodies that you can actually neutralize the virus. This is very important. Uh, so there's so much we can learn uh, through looking at the humoral responses uh, from these uh, antibodies. And we're right now conducting a very large uh, seroepidemiology study over a year, 
We're tracking 1,000 people in the Ottawa Montreal region. These are healthcare workers, teachers, uh, people at risk and retirement homes. And we're looking at their antibodies over a year to see how they respond to the exposure. And also, we have no idea how long these antibodies will last in those that are exposed. But prior knowledge with other coronaviruses is that uh, exposure to coronaviruses gives you around between a two to three years of immunity. And after that, the antibodies drop and you become susceptible again. So we need a vaccine. And this is how we produce our vaccine in the lab. This is what we're doing. We're doing something completely different. Um, we're trying to produce the spike protein in uh, Nicotitiana uh, bentamiana, which is a tobacco plant that doesn't produce uh, nicotine. I'm um, doing this in collaboration with Dr. Ilimar Altazar here at UOttawa. He's the plant specialist, it's not me. Uh, so this is uh, something that he's been doing for a long time, producing proteins in plants. Why am I doing the proteins in plants? Because you can scale up the production um, and, uh, and it's cheap. You do not need high-tech bioreactors uh, to, to produce these, these crops. Uh, so it, it's a vaccine strategy that can be deployed to um, low-income countries, uh, developing countries, any country that can grow the plant can make this vaccine with a GMP facility, of course. Um, other uh, uh, qualities of developing a plant-based vaccine is that you don't have to worry about the introduction of human pathogens in your bioprocess um, because it's a plant. Uh, when you produce uh, vaccines using human cells or primate cells, you're always concerned that another pathogen comes in and contaminates your vaccine. And finally, we're, we're, we want to do a vaccine that is different, not one that you inject in, in your muscle, um, one that you take up your nose, so a nasal spray. Why? Uh, it's to elicit what is called mucosal immunity. So it's an immunity in the mucosal tissue of your respiratory tracts. Uh, it's an immune response that is driven by IgAs. And this means that those antibodies will be very, very abundant in your respiratory tract where the virus enters. So we're hoping that if you can elicit that sort of immune response, you're going to be able to neutralize the virus even before it enters the cell. So that is the, the strategy that we're, we're trying to deploy here. And then I think this is uh, my last slide. So th this sort of re research requires a very uh, large number of people, collaborations, cross-disciplinary expertise. We need people for doing all sorts of stuff. So in my lab, the, the key people on this project are Yannick Gallipo, um, who is doing all the serology, Jian Jun Jian, who's doing the digital droplet PCR, the diagnostics, Ricardo Mojica, who's doing the cell culture, and Vinay uh, Siragram, uh, who's doing uh, the infection assays, and our collaborators at the National Research Council, um, uh, most uh, importantly, Jamshid Tana, doing the single domain antibodies, and uh, a number of other people, Ilimar Altozar doing the, the plant-based vaccine, Curtis Cooper, who is uh, the clinical lead. He's a physician in the first line of defense in the hospital for, for, the, um, uh, for the patients. And uh, Emilio Alarcon, uh, who uh, I'm collaborating with for designing neutralizing peptides. And this is the University of Ottawa when it's not covered in snow and it's my pleasure to take questions from you. Thank you so much, uh, you know, Mark Andre, and, and really, really nice presentation. You know, like I'm a chemist, and it was really clear to me that uh, I learn a lot. You know, I always learn from you, and that's a privilege. And, and thank you so much. And uh, I have a couple of questions uh, directly from from actually the from the Q and A. Remember, please send the question through the Q and A. I'm gonna go with the first one, which is I, it's a little bit, uh, you know. Um, to the point. So the question is, if in the past 17 years, you know, we couldn't really develop a vaccines for SARS or MERS, and how do you think that the, 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 the improvements in technology can actually help us to develop a, a vaccine for, for, for COVID, for SARS-CoV-2? I love that question. I love that question because in 2003, when we had the first SARS epidemic, labs around the world were developing a vaccine for SARS. They succeeded in developing a prototype vaccine, a vaccine candidate. But when SARS disappeared, what happened is government funding also disappeared. So that vaccine never entered clinical trials. And because of that, we don't have a vaccine today. Had that vaccine entered clinical trials, we would have had a platform to simply modify the antigen of that vaccine and rapidly deploy a vaccine now for SARS-CoV-2. So the reason why we don't have a vaccine today is the failure of our governments to invest in prevention. 
um, it was a matter of time that another coronavirus was to come around, and we, we knew that. This, it's the same complication with influenza. Um, the 1918 Spanish flu uh, that killed tens of millions of people uh, is expected, or a virus similar, an influenza virus similar, is expected to come back around. We need good vaccines for these infectious respiratory viruses. We need governments to continue the funding from the beginning to the end. And this is why we don't have a vaccine now, not because uh, we didn't have the technology. Uh, we have better technology now, for sure. Uh, but we need governments to continue the funding, even if this virus appears to disappear, it won't, but appears to disappear, we need the governments to, to, to carry through until a vaccine is deployed. Okay, that, that's a good point, actually. Funding for, for research is, is instrumental in these kind of situations, not only during the pandemic time, but long term. So it's a, that's a good, really good question. I have three questions from Jay Capiria. And, um, uh, Jay is asking us why bats are so susceptible to the viruses, and um, that it's a more is, zoology question. <laughs> that too is a, a fantastic uh, observation. Um, bats, for reasons that we don't fully understand, are outstanding reservoirs for uh, for viruses uh, and and for other uh, pathogens. Somehow, because we know that Ebola is also, the, the bats are the reservoir for Ebola, bats are the reservoirs for rabies, bats are reservoirs for coronaviruses. Bats have something with their immune system that we don't understand that manages to um, control inflammation, uh, but not altogether get rid of the pathogen. So the pathogen remains there and somehow the, the, the host uh, does not develop uh, a, a, a pathogenic uh, immune response. So what kills humans is not the virus, it's the, the immune stimulation caused by the virus. Uh, we have water in our lungs, not because of the virus, but because of their immune response. Bats don't develop that, and we don't understand why. So bats are capable of dampening their immune response in a remarkable way that we don't understand. There's so much we can learn from bats. Okay, Jay has another question. It's a uh, disproof free inactivity of this RNA dependent on the RNA polymerase is only available in SARS-CoV-2 or is common to other coronaviruses? All coronaviruses appear to have this uh, proofreading ability. It's encoded in the non-structural protein 14 uh, that is part of that first polyprotein being produced by the coronavirus. So all coronaviruses, to my knowledge, uh, have this proofreading ability. I mean, the, the, the genome is so big of the coronavirus that if it were to introduce too many mutations at the same time, uh, it would be completely lethal uh, for the virus. And the last question from Jay is that uh, this is probably more of a medical advice, okay? So feel free not to say, not to answer <laughs> because we cannot give medical advice. So he has um, heard that the Advil has some kind of effect on the AC2, ACE2 as receptor. And uh, well, he's asking if it's safe to take during COVID-19, during the infection, uh, so. Yeah, no, so I, 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 we don't dispense medical advice. We leave that to the <laughs> physicians. Uh, I do the molecular stuff. I let the physicians do the medical stuff. Okay. So um, Angela is asking us, uh, well, he's thanking us for, for the talk as, as we did it. Um, so he's asking about it, if the big amount of papers that every second are released in terms of the new possibility of risk of mutations um, so how does this affect the development of a vaccine? So it's probably for the strain that they're using for the vaccine. Um, that is absolutely a concern. So uh, the epitopes that are exposed to the immune system uh, in a virus like this, so the virus does have proofreading, but it still makes mutations at much higher rate than, uh, you know, I would say our genome. So it's a virus that is still evolving and acquiring mutations. So what happens is that if the immune system always targets the same epitopes on the surface of the virus, that induces what we call a selective pressure. So the viruses that will mutate and not have that uh, ability to be neutralized will have a, an advantage to proliferate. And this is what's gonna happen with the coronavirus, even if we do develop a vaccine, is that in a matter of time, where the, that vaccine will fail. Uh, it, it is almost guaranteed unless the virus is completely eradicated from the surface of the earth. 
Um, we, it might take a decade, several generations of vaccines to, to do that. Uh, we might have a, a, an annual vaccine like the influenza vaccine. I don't know, but it, it is definitely a problem, a very big problem. And um, Hector Novo is asking us about he's asthmatic and if he's, uh, if he's wondering if he's infected with COVID, uh, will be he severely affected? I think the answer is he's in the high risk population, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah. This is an, uh, not medical, but epidemiological um, uh, question. Um, everything we know about the virus, if we have an underlying respiratory condition, um, chances are of developing complications to COVID-19 are extremely high. So these are the individuals that need to be protected uh, and need to, uh, to, to, to comply to social distancing. And Harley Fernandez is asking the question that we are all wondering, right? So if, if uh, there's any probability that another severe acute respiratory syndrome related virus could emerge in the next years. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, all virologists have been ringing a bell of warning for a very long time to governments saying uh, there is an underfunding for infectious respiratory, respiratory viruses. And unfortunately, governments like to react, not to prevent. And therefore, uh, this has been underfunded. But we, we are definitely expecting another respiratory virus in the next few years, for sure. And I have a question from Dr. Loreto Laval from Chile. And um, she's wondering if you have a, what has been your experience in the, with plasma phoresis and of using the antibodies from patients and uh, if you have any uh, you know, experience with that, or you know of any group within Ottawa working around that? So um, I know that the, using convalescent serum uh, to treat uh, COVID-19 patients uh, was done very early in China and Wuhan. Uh, the most, uh, in fact, uh, most severely affected individuals were being already treated there. Um, this is an old method that's been around for a very, very long time. Uh, to help those infected. The, the, to the best of my knowledge with the current literature is that it does work uh, for COVID-19 uh, patients. It's not something that can be deployed as prophylaxis, uh, but there are a large number now of uh, clinical trials, randomized clinical trials that will be measuring with high uh, accuracy the effectiveness of convalescent serum as a potential uh, therapeutic for COVID-19 patients. Uh, we expect it to be uh, good, uh, but we, we need a clinical trial to be able to properly measure, you know, how, how many people will survive and and come out of it uh, healthy. So, and the last question is going to be mine. So, and it's going to be a more of a personal question. So, how has been actually the last couple of months living in all this pandemic and and being really, you know, the one leading so many great projects? And how how do you see the the scientific community is it's going to change? From, from this time in the future? Well, right now I've been surprised to see the level of collegiality in research. Uh, we often talk about the competition and uh, a very toxic environment uh, where people wanna come up top and um, are behaving um, unethically sometimes to get ahead. What I've seen so far uh, during this epidemic is scientists have come together um, much more and there's an increased appreciation with interdisciplinary expertise. Because we know that to get out of this, um, it's not, a, you don't only need a virologist. Uh, you need a protein uh, engineer, you need biochemists, uh, you need chemists, uh, maybe a plant biologist. Who would think of plant biologists come out of this? Maybe that, that's the person you need. Uh, a biologist to work with the animals. Uh, you, you, you also need the, the, the technicians, the nurses, the doctors. Uh, epidemiologists are, are, have been extremely important for this. So people who do math, who, who, whoever thinks they're important. <laughs> so uh, there, there has been a huge collaboration between these communities and there was a renewed pleasure in doing science at this time with all of these people. And this is what I, I'm experiencing right now is this uh, the, 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 pure, the purity, the beauty of the science coming together. Uh, that, that's great. I mean, uh, no, you're not alone on that. And I think that it's, it's the spirit of something really Canadian, right? That's the way that, uh, to do things. And this is one exemplary, you know, of, of how we do it. And so we're working together 
And I think that I hope this seminar will help everyone. Okay, so uh, I think that uh, we are done for today. And again, thank you so much, Mark Andre. It was great. And we actually went a little bit over time, but I think that everyone enjoyed your presentation. It was super clear. And, and thank you everyone, all the attendees. And thank you, Caldo, for actually letting us to, to spread the word on, on COVID. Thank you, Caldo. Hi, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Well, on behalf of Caldo Consortium, I would like to thank you both, Emilio and Mark Andre. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. I think it was very, very interesting to all of the, the people that attended. Um, for those of you who, who were part of this, of this session, if you were not able to view it fully, if you would join us, join us after it started, we're going to be posting it, posting it in our YouTube channel, so you may view it at a later time. If there are students interested on doing their graduate studies in Canada, you may see our contact information on your screen right now, so please feel free to contact us at any time. We'll be very happy to hear from you. And um, again, thank you very much, Emilio, and thank you very, mar very much, Mark andre um, uh, This has been a pleasure. I uh, hope everyone has a very wonderful afternoon.